first example I've got is to do with surveys and polls, you'll understand. The second one is tracking the Mongolian rally. And finally, I've got some, a little task for you to do after, after you leave the whole conference. So oh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. OK, so first of all, Sterling Geo is basically a part of a group called Sterling Power Group, which is, uh, it used to be an electricity company. So they fit power lines, substations, they do CAD design, and then actually implement those designs. So we've taken on their ethos of engineering, but in geography. So Sterling Geo, is, we like to call ourselves like an engineering um, geography company. A few of the things that you might not know is that, as well as FME, we also uh, resell the Hexagon product portfolio in the UK. As part of that, we get access to also the um, UAVs, and also we do the ground surveying work. All right. So this is just a quick diagram. Like I said, you've got Sterling Power at the top, and then you've got Sterling Geo over there, the baby company, been around for about two years uh, as part of the larger group. And um, you know we think we're we're helping the people solve the problems um, in an efficient and timely manner. Okay, so let's oh, skip all that now. <laughs> all right, so this is this is what you're all here for, really. So you've all got ideas about your data, what it looks like on the cloud. You know you've got you got aerial photography, you've got uh, inspections, you've got photos, you've got everything. Most people have this visualization. You know, they look up, they see their bone, they want to go after it. It's exactly the shape that they want it to be in. And that's nice. That's our job to make it look like that. But what's the reality? Well, this is the reality. So the man on the ground is a person that needs access to that data in whatever shape or form that you've used it. Uh, sorry, put it up there in. And try and gain access to it, which is fit for purpose for their own everyday needs. So. This is where we go about tailoring the solutions for those people rather than for all of us who like technically like to put a really nice solution in the cloud and you know, be really happy with it. So first of all, what, what is all this cloud business about? And um, you know, you've got all your, your phone data, you've got your emails, you've got your shopping, you've got your TV, your films, your music. At the end of the day, um, it's all just data. And that's what you need to manage. And this is one of the ethos is from um, SAFE as well. When you look at all of these things, what is it? Just managing data, putting it somewhere that you have to um, organize, manage, and disseminate. So like I, said, like I said, the first workbench, I should shut up and just show you this. OK, so, <laughs> so <laughs> like Steve said, I, I'm the business development manager. So for me, this is what I call a quick win. Uh, when I put my um, when I put my technical hat back on, this is what's called not getting the specification uh, spec correctly uh, put out. So, what we need to do, we need to have a look at certain projects and how we set them up. So, before we start actually writing the workbench, we need to start looking at the scope of a project. So, the first uh, first example I've got is we had two weeks to basically put up a service that people would use live in the field and they're around high voltage electricity, and we need to make sure they were safe, we need to know where they were going, so it had real world implications. So going back to the technical side, you, know, you do need to do all this proprietary work beforehand. It was gonna be a six month program, there was extensions to do other work, and this is where SAFE really, really helped us out, because at, when we did this project, there was, the FME cloud was not actually formed at that time, so we had a server instance that we put up on our own cloud, which was client facing, what we were able to do, um, thanks to SAFE, was actually only pull up that license for the period of the project as basically as a case study, so as if how it would work in the cloud. So as you, can, you, know, as you might think, we had to get a bit of a move on. So we did, so we took the cheese, ran with it. I took the problem and ran to my technical team, and then they went about solving it. <laughs> so what we actually did, so we confirmed the FME setup uh, with Craig, so many thanks to him. I don't know if he's here, but um, he was a, it was a great help to us. And we had to make a portal which the project managers could use to actually manage the, the workflows for the people going out in the field. We then also had to make an application on the phone so the surveys could actually see which fields they were going into and which actual polls they were going to assess. 
So this was basically, this was the end product of the portal. So what actually happens here is that obviously you have your map, you have your, your poles, um, they change color when they've been um, inspected. And what actually was happening at the top is that you had loads of parameters that you could pick and these maps were printed off as part of uh, the workflow and that needed to be monitored. So we knew which maps had been printed and which uh, work data sets had been passed out. Okay, so um, one of the advantages of doing this is, although it was a probably six month project, this was one of the beauties of putting it in the cloud. We could ramp up the work, uh, you know, whether it's from five surveyors to 30 surveyors, how many maps they wanted to do. Some days it was like 10 maps, some days it was 1,000 maps, and you know, it, was a, it was a lot of, lot of work to go in. And at the end of the day, you know, they had to put, put in 60,000 reports in this six month period. So this is where we utilize the FME server, and it was absolute godsend for us, because um, to be able to take our work package, uh, so our workbench, and actually publish it, and kind of just let everyone access it without knowing they're accessing it was actually very good. So okay, so here, here is the real workbench. So, you know. <laughs> um, what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna zoom into a couple of the areas. This is what it looked like in entirety. Um, sorry we didn't follow the, uh, the, you know, the 10 transformer rule. However, we did, if you do notice, use best practice. So we've got the nice bookmarks, annotations, and um, setting it up right, which is quite nice from the new version of the software as well. Okay, so we look at the top bit, and all this effectively does is this bit here enables you to write a copyright statement and any disclaimers that you need to on the map. And the bottom bit basically creates basically the postcode information and location. So when that's printed onto the map, uh, when the drivers are out in the field, they're able to put it in their sat nav and get to the nearest known location um, in their vans. And then the bottom bit, basically that creates a timestamp at the top, which is pretty straightforward. And the bottom bit actually helps to actually create the PDF. So what that did was when you had to define the margins ar um, around the map and the scales, it did it dynamically. So uh, however people were zoomed in or, sorry, zoomed into the portal or whatever they needed, that was what was available. Uh, we can take questions on this at the end, so um, feel free to question it as much as you like afterwards. <laughs> okay, so because we run that project for six months, it would have been really nice, you know, um, we could have used FME Cloud because that would have been nice and simple. We wouldn't have to have the infrastructure. We could have just set up the, it, it wasn't available at the time, but this is what we demonstrated could be done. So we did, we did a project for six months, run it, it worked, then we closed it down, and that was it. So the only difference between putting it on FME Cloud and our, and our solution at the time was we paid for the license for six months. Um, on this instance, you went and, and deployed it, and this, this situation, you'd probably have a subscription package, which, was, which is quite nice as well. So this is one of the things that I alluded to right at the start. So how do you get everyone to use FME server? Well, basically, you don't tell them they're using FME server. You give them all the applications and the tools that are powered by server in the background, whether that's within their own clouds for security reasons or whether it's actually um, in the cloud cloud, <laughs> like I say sometimes. So uh, this is basically what the surveyors had. They didn't know what was going on behind the scenes. There was an application that we made, click on it, and it brought up uh, the maps that were streamed down to them. In this particular instance, we did have access to internet, so it was pretty easy. Uh, we do have situations where, which I'll go on to the next example, where we might not have very good internet access, so we have to come up with innovative ways to actually store that data or retrieve that data and then pass it on to server. Okay, so some of the things that are being considered going forward, and which was nice to see yesterday actually, so obviously when they're doing the assessments, it comes back to FME server to say, yes, I've, I've checked this poll, condition is very good. We then want that to be billed to our end client. So we're looking at automating that service through FME server as well to produce the uh, invoices, and also route planning to optimize how to get from poll to poll. Hopefully all of this <laughs> would basically mean that um, the surveyors are not out in the rain too much. Now, I understand here in Vancouver, it's my first time here, you know, 
uh, everyone walks around like this all the time. It rains quite a lot here, apparently. So <laughs> what, we would like, what we got from this, the cloud was brilliant for us with this situation. It was extremely flexible, and so was the approach from Safe with us. Um, it was very speedy, and I don't know if you've seen the word cow in any of the presentation in the last three days. I'll go and buy your pint. So I just thought I'd put that up there. So <laughs> feel free to take me up on that. Right. So the second example um, is one, you know, is one of our daily sort of things that we do. Not really, but uh, <laughs> so on this particular example, we wanted to use FME Cloud because we've got a client who's doing things for charity, and he's going to take this 1.2 Fiat Punto all the way from England all the way across to Mongolia and drive it back again. <laughs> so I'll, I'm going to give you a little bit of a break this time. So I'm going to just play this video. Hopefully it will play. Matt Sully, one of Sterling Geo's clients from Exmoor National Park, is about to set off on the trip of a lifetime. Leaving the tranquility of the Exmoor National Park behind, Matt plus two other teammates will be driving through southern Russia, Kazakhstan and Iran as part of the Mongolian Rally, a gruelling 10,000 mile journey from London to the ancient Mongolian capital of Ilambatar. And they're using this, a 2006 Fiat Punto. Travelling to me is a sort of... I need to explore the world. Um, so I've been to Nepal, been to Australia, and so this time round uh, I wanted to use a vehicle. And uh, so the Mongolian Rally was, uh, was just a thing. I love the Fiat Punto because, um, yeah, it's a Fiat Punto and it's going to get us all the way to uh, Mongolia <laughs> and uh, hopefully intact because I've got to drive it back as well. And uh, so, yeah, so when we get to Ulaanbaatar, we're going to... Uh, we're going to have a pit stop and then uh, drive uh, 5,000 miles back. The team at Sterling Geo have offered to install a tracking device in Matt's car to provide a feed on their official website. It's capable of giving real-time updates with a mobile data link, but with the costs of roaming abroad, the tracking data will be written to a memory stick that can then be emailed back to the UK. Hi Matt, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. How are you doing? I'm good, you? Very well, yes. Do you want to get this installed in the car? Uh, yeah, why not? <laughs> Jenny Luther Thomas from Sterling Geo has designed and programmed the pie for Matt to use. So this is the Raspberry Pi. Okay. It's a really small computer based on Linux, so under the case it's about the size of a credit card yeah. um, and runs off micro USB, so you've got the port there. Yeah. Um, what we've done is put the GPS dongle on here, okay. so when it's on, that will be flashing blue to show you you've got a fix. Okay. Um, every time you turn the Raspberry Pi on, all the data that it writes to the Pi is going to get copied to the USB stick. So when you get to like a computer cafe, internet cafe, yeah. take the USB stick out as long as the Pi is turned off plug it in and email us all the files on there. Um, if anything's going wrong, you don't think it's working or no, there's no data on the USB stick, in this little box I've sellotaped to the top, um, we have a spare USB stick okay. and a spare memory card. So you can yep. just swap those in the Pi. We've got our email address on there, so you don't forget who to email it to. And then FME will take care of the rest. Fantastic. OK, Jenny, is it recording there? It is, yep. Okay, let's go. tracking device from Sterling Geo is going to keep us on track and uh, follow us on the website www.mrts2014.co.uk. I hope to see you soon. Okay, uh, hands up who thinks he's actually going to make it there and back. <laughs> yeah, I do as well.
where does the world is away. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if any of you do want to support him or um, you know just get involved, obviously these are the details of typing Teams Conscious into, uh, into Google, you'll find that page and you can track him. One of the things we've asked Matt to do is basically take um, the zip stuff with him on talk. So um, it's something I'll, I'll talk to you about in, in a few moments, but um, we should be getting a zip on the Mongolian rally as well, so that should be quite nice. Right. So yeah, um, oh yeah, that was it. Almost forgot, again, <laughs> about the workbench. So uh, for this actual system, we actually got one workbench, well, not that one, sorry, Bad joke twice, I know, from <laughs> <laughs> Fuzzy. So, uh, so we've got three stages into the workbench. So first of all, we've got the data loader, which basically takes the GPS feed and uh, cleans it, makes it, oh, sorry, cleans it, attaches it into the CSV and puts it out into the database, which is then ready to be read. We then take that data from the database <coughs> and basically remove duplicates and also calculate certain uh, times for that. And finally, we, uh, we create the KML. So what actually happens here is that it basically will plot points um, on the map. And also when, uh, when map photo, uh, sorry, sends through the, um, the pictures of the zip star, that automatically gets lo uploaded onto the map as well from whichever location is actually um, uh, taking the photo from, you just use the GPS tag. So what we want to do, obviously, uh, we know there's a bit of tie in at the moment, so uh, we took that KML um, URL and pushed it straight into Google Maps Engine. Um, these are some of my test runs, so you see I get around a bit. And uh, you know, this, this is just to test it. So what we have to do at the moment, as part of the workbench as well, there is a bit that removes the test data from the actual live data, so it's just basically timestamp. Um, there are a few oddities in here. It's basically when we turned it on in Loughborough, which is where we are, somewhere here in the Midlands, and then we turned it on again by accident in Scotland because um, we forgot uh, the rest of it. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about. So upstairs in the lobby, there's loads of these little zipsters, and I know some of you have had them before, and you keep them in box in case they're worth a lot of money in the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. <laughs> What, what, we'd really invite, what we'd really like to invite you to do is if you have got these or you're taking them away with you, if you wouldn't mind taking a picture of them from wherever you are, from your home cities, I know you're here from all over the world, um, just either check, email them in to us or just, uh, just tweet them in at Sterling Geo. As you can see, it's been around a bit already, so it's been to Easter Island, not Photoshop, it's been to Sydney, uh, that was on the coast of England over there, and this was actually in Vancouver. Um, so if, if you're able to do that, very much appreciated. And then we put them up on the website anyway, and you can follow the zipster around, and hopefully you can follow it on the Mongolian rally as well. Uh, finally, just want to say thank you for actually attending this presentation. I really appreciate you choosing this one. I know there's loads of brilliant other speakers and uh, you know, lots of things you could learn, so thank you very much for your time. If you want to get in touch, please um, feel free to do so. When uh, we did the wetbench, we did actually get efficiencies on it because uh, when we did, when we had to burn the data into a raster format, uh, basically when we did it in uh, Adobe, it took too long. So you know, you can push it out and it creates its own layers. But when we did it in SME, it actually saved um, a large amount of time. So uh, I think it's how long it saved on it? 
Yeah, so he's printing off like, I don't know, 10,000 maps, a minute here, a minute there, say it was very good. So we were, we were really happy um, with that, especially that aspect of it. So it saves our processing time as well.